Welcome to Campbellsville Baptist Church. I'm Brad Lauer, the discipleship pastor. It's my honor and privilege to be with you today as we look into God's Word, study God's Word, and to explore who God wants us to be. Um, we're going to continue our study on strong men of the Bible and look at different characteristics. Last time we looked at, um, we looked at Jacob. This time we're going to look at Samson and, and dive in and do an overview. I think in the past I've done a whole study on Samson um, in different episodes in his life. But we're just going to do an overview and look at individual character of who he was. Because the story of Samson, many of us want to focus on Samson's failures. But I think we need to look at it in a different light into what God's grace is in his life. And so we're going to do that. So if you'll, if, you'll, um, if you'll pray with me. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your grace and your mercy in teaching us who you are through different characters. And as we study Samson, may, we, may our eyes be open to who he is and who you called him to be and how you worked in his life and how we can learn and glean information from his life to apply to ours. And so God bless our time. Give us focus. Give us insight. Give us discernment. In Jesus' name, amen. So Samson. Samson was a twofold person. Samson was a lover and he was a fighter. I believe this is a story of more of God's grace than of Samson's failures, though he, he failed miserably. Samson was a, a little bit full of himself. And we're in the time of the judges. This is where a judge would come and save the people. And then they would follow this judge. It wasn't like a judge that sat on a bench, like a, like a judge in our courts, but more of a leader, uh, more of a, a general, a president, not a president, but a leader that would make sure the country was safe and bring people back to God. And this was a cycle that went on and on and on. And Samson is one of those known judges. And so his story is found back in Judges chapter 13. And we'll be there in just a moment in Judges 15. Um, but this was a time where it, when every man did what was right in their own eyes. Not what was in right in the eyes of the Lord, but what they thought was right. And you know what happens in society when we are in charge, when we think we know better than anybody else of what is justifiable um, our last interim pastor, transitional pastor, Rusty Ellison, would always say that men can justify anything. We can justify anything. We can rationalize it to make it happen the way we want it to happen. And if we have a wife that can help us combat that, it keeps us out of a whole lot more trouble. And I have such a wife that helps keep me grounded. Um, but men can do and justify anything and rationalize anything they want to make it okay, whether it's a purchase they want to make or an act they want to do. And Samson, you know, he was in the midst of that. We don't really know what Samson looked like. Many of us want to believe that he looked like the old wrestling star Hulk Hogan, big and brawny and strong because of the stories that we read about his conquer, the conquering that he did. Or was he more like Pee Wee Herman, a little bitty short guy that just had superpower strength? When you, when you think of the name Samson, we, be honest, I see this big, strong wrestler with long hair and walked around with a chip on his shoulder. He was extremely gifted physically um, in different ways. And, and sometimes it gets you in trouble. So let's go on and look at Judges chapter 13. And so I'll read, I'll skip around Judges chapter 13, 1 through 5, then Judges 20, verses 24 and 25, and then we'll jump over to chapter 15 because there's a lot going on with Samson. He's got more time in the book of Judges dedicated to him than any other judge. And so uh, let's read. 
Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. So in other words, they rebelled against God. So God took them and said, okay, since you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to let somebody else be in charge of you. So they were put into slavery by the Philistines. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant. Have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor, because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. We flip over to verses 24 and 25. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Maneadan between Zorah and Estol. And then we jump down. We'll stop there for a second. So Israelites are enslaved by the Philistines. However, God in His faithfulness always provided a way out for His people. We talk about in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God provides a way out when we're, we feel crushed and trapped by sin. And there's always a way out. We've never been given more than we can bear, and there's always a way out. So He intervenes to the people by going to a barren or childless family and says, you're going to have a son, but there are going to be conditions on his life. He's going to have to be a Nazarite. A Nazarite vow is simple, to separate himself to the Lord. And so there are requirements of a Nazarite. Many people took a Nazarite vow for a short term, for a period of time, but Samson's life was dedicated to this. So he was to not have any wine or strong drink or anything from the grape. He couldn't shave or cut his hair. He can never go near a dead body, not even family members. That was, that's the Nazarite vow. And once time is finished, a ceremony, head shaving, sacrifices, and food and wine would happen. There would be a ceremony. But Samson's lot, whole life was to be dedicated this way. Like there were people throughout Scripture who took a Nazarite vow, but they did it for a period of time. Not Samson. His whole life was to be spent this way. And what do you think when you hear the word deliverance? It was in verse 5 in chapter 13. It said, He will take the lead in delivering, or he be the deliverer of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Not like delivering a package or delivering a baby. He's going to deliver a nation. He's going to be responsible for that. And so then we, we jump over to Judges chapter 15. And so we're going to read chapter 15. Later on at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. Remember, we skipped a lot of things about his marriage and about how all that happened. So, But we're going to look more. So he went to his wife, who was not an Israelite, but a Philistine. But her father would not let him go in. I was sure you hated her, he said, that I gave her to your companion. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Samson said to them, This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes and tied their tails, tied them tail, tail to tail in pails and pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torch, and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and, and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. When the Philistines asked who did this, they were told Samson, the Temanite son-in-law, son because his wife was given to his companion. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I swear I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Adam. Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Leah. The people of Judah asked, Why have you come to fight us? We've come to take Samson prisoner, they said, to him as he did to do to him as he did to us. Then three thousand men of Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done? 
And he answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agree, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lee, Lee, the Philistines came toward him, shouting, The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax. The bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, With a donkey's jawbone I've made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone I've killed a thousand men. He's such a poet. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramaliah. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, Lord, you've given me your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up a hollow place, and the water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he was revived. So the spring was called en Hakor, and is still there today. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Whew, man, he was a strong person. The power of God came over him. He had admirable qualities. He, he trusted God. He called out to God. He, he depended on God. God gave him strength. God blessed him, and God made him a leader. He was fearless. He just didn't want somebody to kill him before he had a chance for God to reveal God's plan. He, and God blessed him, and God cared for him, and God gave him everything he needed. But God, I can see a little bit of Samson, a little bit of arrogance. You know, you gave me this blessing to kill all these people, but now I'm thirsty. I'm going to die. So God took care of him. Let me ask you a question. Who in your life has God placed for you to lead? There's another area of, um, you know, there are a couple points. Fearless leadership comes from God calling and empowering. And that's what happened there. The second one is, we've got to be careful. There's failure to exercise self-control. Well, when we fail to exercise self-control, it will leave us powerless. In Judges chapter 16, verses 4 through 22, sometime later he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him, so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up. Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been drilled, dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. When the men hidden in the room, she called Samson, The Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings and easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Hmm. Then Delilah said to Samson, You made me look like a fool. You lied to me. Come, tell me how you can be tied. He said, If anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I will become as weak as any other man. So guess what Delilah does? She took new ropes and tied him with them. Then the men hidden in the room, with the men hidden in the room, she called to called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as they were threads. Delilah said to Samson, All this time you've been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He said, If you weave the seven braids of my hair into the fabric of the loom and tighten it with the pen, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took seven braids of his head, wove them into a fabric, and tightened them with the pen. She called Samson, Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pen and the loom with the fabric. Then he said, Then she said, How can you say you love me? She just has a way about her. And he is so blinded by love. He said, When you won't confide in me, this is the third time you've made a fool out of me and you haven't told me the secret. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick of it to death. So he told her everything. No razor's ever been used on my head. 
because I have been a Nazarite, dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as other men. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she went, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He's told me everything. So the rulers returned with silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off his seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called Samson. They're here. He woke up and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged his eyes out, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they sent him to grinding grain in the prison. But his hair on his head began to grow after he had been shaved. Samson's life can be summed up in this, this section because he had no self-control. Whatever he wanted throughout life, he did. He married somebody not from his people, but a Philistine. And he was tempted by her. He was deceitful, deceit. He was tricked <laughs> by her. And she just had a way to work him. If you notice the progression, it was... It was bowstrings, and it was ropes, and it was uh, then it was something to do with his hair, which got him close to the point of shaving his head. And see how the progression goes. A little by little, it becomes something different. We go from strings to ropes, which are like braids, which he had braids in his hair, which was the next one, and then they cut off those seven braids. Seemed to let life be game. Samson thought, had too much faith in his own ability, is what I'm trying to say, and that he treated life like a game. He kept giving in to temptation. Verse 20 says that Samson did not know the Spirit of the Lord had left him. So did his arrogance and his pride get in the way, and he assumed that it would always be there? Are we, this, are we any different? Sometimes when you go down that road of sin and pride and, and think so much, you, you have a false sense of security in your own abilities. What would you lose in your life if you gave in to temptations around you? We recently went to see a, a Christian comedian, um, and since that has come out, that um, he has this secret sin, this secret life, and it's destroyed his career. He's come clean and asked for forgiveness, and I pray, and we gathered and prayed for him the other day, that it will, he will be humbled and that he will change, he will get help so that he can, and we will see a picture of God's restoration and grace and mercy in the end. In Judges 16, we're going to look that's a, towards the end of um, his life. Um, it's 23 through 31, because God. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land. And multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. No telling what that looked like. When they stood among the pillars, when they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on, on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. When Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, please remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just one more time and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the center pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistine. Then he pushed with all his might. And down came the temple and the rulers and all the people. Thus he killed more when he died than when he was alive. 
Then his brothers and his father, father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and his Eshtol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel for 20 years. In 16, verse 22, right before this it says, but, their ha- but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Is that redemption? Is that grace? Is that restoration? Did, did Samson realize what he had done and, and so God was restoring him, still letting him fulfill his, his calling? Do you think in the end Samson understood his true calling? It wasn't just a warrior, but it was to put an end to the Philistines one way or the other. And maybe the story changed a little bit based on his behavior. But in the end, God's story continues. And his prayer, his prayer says, Pray, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, give me the strength I once had. And Samson makes it into the Hall of Faith. In Hebrews, he is mentioned as one of the great men of faith because of this act. It's amazing how we look at Samson and we think of Samson as this person that gave in and that did all these bad things. But he's recorded as one of the men, one of the people in the Hall of Great faith in Hebrews chapter 11 I'll read it it says and what more shall I say do not have time to tell you about Gideon Barak Samson Jephthah about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms administered justice and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women re- received back their dead, raised to life again. And so on and so on. And so Samson is recorded with these people. And as we look at, at, at Simon, uh, Simon, Samson's last days, we, we see that he killed more people in his death than he ever did while he was alive. And they say, I mean, at least a thousand that he killed at one time with the jawbone of a donkey. God brings Samson's story full circle. From chosen, from the chosen deliverer of Israel who was set apart, set aside as a Nazarite, took on that lifestyle to champion. Now, he might have been a deeply flawed champion, but he was still God's champion of Israel. And even in death, God fulfills his purpose. His purpose was to leave and to de- lead and deliver Israel from the Philistines. We don't always know how that looks and how that's going to happen, but God gives promises that these things will happen. Samson didn't know how he was going to do it. He thought he'd do it by pure might, by scaring him to death while he was alive. Little did he know that his story was going to end with him dying in the midst of. Because sometimes our, con- our consequences of our sins are great, though God can still use them. Samson's story is a story of God's sovereignty and grace. When we are able to see this truth by faith, we can be fearless leaders and redeemed failures before God because I, I have failed many times and I know that God restores and, and renews me when I do. If I come back to him humbly as, as Samson did, O sovereign Lord, you don't say that unless you understand who you are and whose you are. You don't say that if you don't, if you don't know your place. When we're able to see this truth by faith, we can be fearless leaders and redeemed failures before God. So what challenged you in this story? What, what is it about Samson's story that intrigues you and intrigues me and causes me to give pause? And for me, it's that Samson liked himself a little bit too much. He took God's gifts and his, his, his abilities a little bit 
selfishly. In other words, I, he thought they were more about him than they were about God. And you can see through his life that he, he went in and out of his intimacy with God. But in the end, Samson realized who he was and what his purpose was. And God allowed that purpose, purpose to be revealed in the end and great things happened because of it. We all have struggles. Samson had many struggles, pride and arrogance and, and women and, and so many, and, and a lot of it was arrogance and the pride. And we all have those things. What entices you? What intrigues you? What, what, what tempts you? But we know this. Through our struggles, God can work in those struggles and help us to become strong. That's what he did with Samson. This is a story about God's grace and mercy. And it, it also tells me that God has a bigger plan than what we can understand. We may see the little battles. God's got a bigger plan. God has blessed Samson for a purpose. He was going to deliver them from the Philistines. Now, it happened differently than what maybe many of us or even them thought at the moment. But, he, but in his death, he gave the ultimate sacrifice to win the battle. And as you think about your life and you think about your story and you think about your lasting legacy, what do you desire your final chapter to be? Samson's chapters were full of different things, but in the end, his final chapter was one of God's mercy, grace, and purpose. So what steps do you need to take with God today in order to get to that point in the future? Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, and we thank you for the life of Samson, who in some perspective, lived a roller coaster life of highs and lows and, and success and failures and, and wise decisions and poor decisions. And so, God, I pray that you will teach us those lessons. Teach us that you, that you are the way that you have a purpose for each of our lives. And we may try to mess it up and get in the way of that purpose, but in the end, God, you have a purpose for our life. If we will stay faithful to you, you will see that come true. And so, God, I thank you for those moments. I thank you that you're a God that loves us unconditionally and will never, never give up on us. You will always pursue us and run after us and hold, you, hold us in your hands as you did even with Samson and his rebellion. But in the end, he understood. And so, God, as we close our time together, may it be a time that we have been challenged by your word, that we come deeper in love, become deeper in love with you because we've encountered you in Holy Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us today as we looked at Samson. Next time we gather, we're going to look at Jeremiah. We're going to look at his life. And, you know, there's so many things that can be said about Jeremiah. So we're going to explore those next time and so i hope you'll come back and join us uh, for that you can always um, look it up on um, our website you can go to uh, www.camelsvillebaptistchurch.com and in that website you'll see some resources or watch this and you can go and you can search for different bible studies or different sermons that have been posted there to to catch up or to go back and watch again or to see what else is out there look at our website and see the different ways that you can connect and become a part of what God is doing through our church. We've got many things going on, a lot of great ministries going on. We hope that you will be a part of that. We'd love for you to be a part of us live. On Sunday mornings, we'd love for you to be here. We gather at 915 for what we call Sunday school or their Bible study groups, and they're divided up based on life stage and age and gender or married couples or whatever. We have a place for you. Uh, no matter your age or your life stage, we have a place for you uh, to join in with the other believers and other people to study God's Word together and to do life together. We also gather at 1030 every Sunday for worship. Come, come be a part of that. Come be a part of the worship where we give God praise for who He is in our lives, what He's done around our lives, and what He wants to do. And then we also hear from our pastor, Dr. Dwayne Norman, um, a biblical message about who God is and what God wants for us. And so I hope that you'll come at 915 for Sunday School, 1030 for worship. Um, if you're unable to join us in person, you can always go to Facebook, and we're on there live every Sunday morning for worship. 
You can go to the different TV channels or you can um, click on our live stream that's on our website as well. And so we want to invest in you and we want you to be connected with us so that we can show others who Jesus is.